Good evening and welcome to The Frame, an initiative of Access Framingham. I'm Brendan Fitzpatrick. We begin tonight with insight on the upcoming primary elections as voters and officials prepare for March 5th, Super Tuesday, here in Framingham and across Massachusetts. Outside of the big presidential races, some residents in the city will be tasked with choosing 35 members to make up the Framingham Democratic Committee. The group's goal is to support and promote the local, state, and national levels of the Democratic Party, meaning that only registered Democrats in Framingham, along with unenrolled or independent voters who request a Democratic ballot, will be able to vote on this matter. A pair of coalitions, aptly named Group 1 and Group 2, have been created. Group 1 has 34 members and Group 2 has 24, with former state representative and Senator David Magnani running as a non-group candidate. Voters should note that they don't have to vote for one group or the other. They can mix and match up to 35 candidates regardless of their group affiliation. Some of the notable candidates in Group 1 include 7th Middlesex District State Representative Jack Patrick Lewis, City Councilors Tracy Bryant, Adam Steiner, Brandon Ward, and Leslie White Harvey, plus former City Councilor Cesar Stewart Morales, School Committee Member William Labarge, and former Mayor Yvonne Spicer. Group 1's website claims that they're the more experienced and united group for the city's Democrats, adding that they're on the ballot to, quote, advance democracy in our community and country, end quote. Group 2, meanwhile, features officials such as state representative for the 6th Middlesex District, Priscilla Souza, at-large city councilor George King, former state representative and city councilor John Stefanini, school committee members Jessica Barnhill and Adam Freudberg, as well as former city councilor Michael Rossi, and the chair of the city's Strategic Initiatives and Financial Oversight Committee, Mary Kay Feeney. Group 2's website, which labels the coalition as the city's Democrats for Change, contends that new voices within the party have not been provided with a proper platform by the committee's leadership. The 24-member group explains that they've left 11 spots open to, quote, welcome new people, end quote, to the FDC. Additional details regarding the upcoming primary elections on Super Tuesday were provided by Framingham City Clerk Lisa Ferguson during Tuesday's City Council meeting. Ballots for the Democratic, Republican, and Libertarian parties will be available for residents. Unenrolled and independent voters will be able to choose any of those ballots, according to Ferguson. When an unenrolled voter chooses a party option, they are just making a ballot choice. They're not registering in that party. Now, under state law, voters are not allowed to change which ballot they'll be voting with after making their official decision. So Ferguson has strongly recommended that unenrolled and independent voters look at the sample ballots found on the city's website before making their selection. Saturday, February 24th at 5 p.m. is the deadline to register to vote in the primary or to change party enrollment, while the deadline to apply for a mail-in ballot is 5 p.m. on Tuesday, the 27th. Ferguson said that mail-in ballots must be received by election night at 8 p.m. and that anyone with a mail-in ballot already should return it as soon as possible. Place your ballots in one of the two drop boxes, either at McAuliffe Library or behind the Memorial Building. The sooner we receive the ballots back, the easier it is for my office to process them. Mail-in ballots will not be accepted at polling locations on March 5th. Saturday, meanwhile, also marks when early voting will begin at the Memorial Building and the McAuliffe Branch Library. Early voting runs through Friday, March 1st, with polls at the library open from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Polling hours at the Memorial Building will vary. Anyone with any questions is advised to reach out to the City Clerk's Office by calling 508-532-5520 or by emailing cityclerk at framinghamma.gov. Later during that City Council meeting on Tuesday, a public hearing was held regarding the Mary Denison Park renovation project. Councilors heard about the proposal to increase the appropriation and bond authorization for the ongoing renovation plan, which includes the installation of a multi-use synthetic turf field, a natural turf field for softball, a playground, and a splash pad. Tuesday's motion called for the appropriation of around $23.5 million for the park project, on top of the close to $20 million that were appropriated back in 2019 by the City Council. In total, that's about $43.2 million appropriated for the project and costs related to it. 
Jim Snyder, the director of Parks and Rec for Framingham, reminded counselors that some of the cost for the renovation is being covered by the Avery Denison Corporation. An agreement with the city calls for Avery Denison paying for 82% of the first $14.5 million of remediation costs, along with other expenditures. While Snyder added that more than $1.5 million in state grants have been provided to Framingham for the park plan. Rad Sports is primed to have their bid on the project of close to $36.5 million accepted by Framingham. Documents provided to the City Council show that Avery Denison would pick up about $13.4 million for the contractor bid. We think we're at a very good place right now. We have solid numbers. We put it out to bid. With this appropriation, we'll be prepared to go ahead and uh, let, uh, issue a uh, letter to award. Members of the City Council voted unanimously in favor of the second reading for the appropriations. District 4's Michael Cannon said he was optimistic to see progress on the project. The grant action alone in the packet is great, but I also think it says so much about our community that we're willing to make the investment. City officials are advising residents about an ongoing epidemic currently happening in Brazil. The nation is currently dealing with an influx of dengue fever. As Brazil's, as Brazil's health ministry is expecting more than 4.2 million cases this year due to factors such as El Nino and climate change, according to the New York Times. Dengue fever is a mosquito-borne illness that is often asymptomatic, but the disease can potentially be life-threatening. Symptoms that do appear typically do so within 3 to 14 days. Those symptoms include rashes, high fevers, headaches, as well as pains to joints and muscles. There is a vaccine made for the virus that causes dengue fever, though Framingham officials have noted that not all strains of the virus may be covered by it. Those traveling to or from Brazil, as well as any other area where dengue fever is on the rise, are strongly recommended to protect themselves from mosquito bites. Wear long sleeves and socks, minimize time spent outside during peak mosquito hours between dusk and dawn, apply insect repellent, ensure that doors and windows have proper screens, and drain any stagnant water in order to prevent eggs from being laid. Anyone experiencing symptoms associated with dengue fever, especially those who have traveled to an area where the virus has been prominent, such as Brazil, should seek medical help. You can find more information on the stories that matter to the community on our website, www.theframe.news. We've got you covered there from need to know updates to local events and beyond. Be sure to, sus to subscribe to our newsletter so you can stay up to date with the weekly Framingham News. And a reminder that you're welcome to reach out to us with any story ideas through our tip line. Send an email to the frame at accessfram.tv or dial 508-216-0003. Coming up on the frame, as Black History Month continues, we highlighted the work of artist Mita Vo Warwick Fuller by taking a visit to the Danforth Art Museum and by speaking to her grandson. Stick around. We'll be right back. Come on. You're not going to get it all right. Just make sure you nail the big stuff. Like making sure your kids are in the right seats for their age and size. Get it right at NHTSA.gov slash the right seat. Welcome back in as we move to our weekly focus now. February is Black History Month, a time to pay tribute to the contributions African Americans have had in our society. It's a celebration of triumphs and accomplishments, but also a time to acknowledge the struggles and adversity that African Americans have had to endure and overcome throughout our nation's history. The Frames Mackenzie Wright joins us now to share more. Mackenzie? Yeah, Brendan, for this edition of our weekly focus and in celebration of Black History Month, we wanted to highlight a groundbreaking African-American sculptor, Mita Faux Warwick Fuller, who stopped at nothing to pursue her passion for the arts. 
Her groundbreaking body of work, which often depicts the African-American experience, is on display at the Danforth Art Museum in Framingham. We caught up with the museum's collections manager to learn more, as well as meet his own grandson, David Fuller, who shared with us the pride he has in his grandmother's legacy. I would observe her as a quiet, you know, very humble, classy woman. I have uh, great memories of her as a, as a young person, but I will admit, and I speak for my, my, uh, my, my brothers and my sister, that none of us really knew the true greatness of this woman. Meet a Vo Warwick Fuller, David Fuller's grandmother. As he puts it, she was a game changer. I could go on and on uh, about what she achieved at an early age and the groundbreaking things she, she did and the people she met and her experiences. Mita Warwick Fuller was born in 1877 in Philadelphia. Um, she came from a middle class uh, African American family and she really showed an early interest in art and she really loved sculpting. She had this very kind of quiet determination throughout her life. A lot of people who knew her have said how she didn't really boast too much. She was very this kind of quiet person, yet even through all the struggles and the kind of expectations she was supposed to have being a woman, an African-American woman, she really stayed focused to what she loved. Rachel Passanante is the collections manager at the Danforth Art Museum, which has its very own exhibit featuring Mita Vo Warwick Fuller's work. Rachel says that the support Mita had from her family to pursue her interests in art was unique at a time when women were often expected to focus themselves on caring for a husband and family. Mita went on to study at the Philadelphia Museum of Industrial Art, as well as various schools and institutions in Paris, where she met the famous French sculptor Rodin. But despite her impressive studies and experiences, Mita was met with challenges when she returned to Philadelphia a few years later. She struggled for a number of years trying to build up her art career. Um, being a woman, she wasn't as accepted in a number of galleries. And she also, being African-American, had struggles trying to get representation in the U.S. But Rachel says Mita's determination paid off when in 1905 she was commissioned to produce several pieces for an exhibition at the Jamestown Tercentennial. She won a gold medal for her, um, for her work, um, which really kind of put her on the map. And then she, after a couple years after that, she still couldn't quite get her career off the ground. Um, her mother was really pushing her to get married, which was typical at the time again. And she met her future husband, Dr. Solomon Fuller, here in um, Massachusetts when she was taking a, a break. In 1909, Mita and Solomon married and moved into a house they built right here in Framingham, the very same house their grandson, David Fuller, came to know well. Well, I didn't realize that she did her work there, upstairs, because it was before my time. That's what my three, three of my brothers and I, that was our bedroom up there. My father made it into two different bedrooms. We were playing, you know, house hockey and running around crazy <laughs> like kids. The Danforth Art Museum has a replica of that space, the attic of the Fuller's home where Mita continued sculpting, even as she took care of her husband and his career, along with her three children. Back in the turn of the century, you know, during that time, a woman's role was to be, you know, a step back. And because uh, my grandmother wasn't hearing that, she was an innovator and a visionary. So she just went ahead with her work. David admits he wasn't able to fully comprehend the true gravity of his grandmother's work until he got older, when he could better understand the influence of her accomplishments like a number of her pieces often associated with the Harlem Renaissance, a golden age for African-American culture in the early 20th century. She never lived in New York City, but she is considered one of the kind of preeminent women's sculptures of the Harlem Renaissance. And this is mostly due to her connection with W.E.B. Du Bois. Danforth has a few pieces of Mita's work directly related to that period, such as a sculpture entitled Water Boy. There's also her portrait bust entitled Negro is Poet, which is believed to be the bust of Maxwell Nisi Hayson, a Harlem Renaissance writer. They're just some of the many works on display here, 
According to Rachel, these pieces of art are getting the word on Mita out. We have one of her works that just went to New York City um, to go to the Met, and then I'll be going to the Smithsonian after that. Um, we had the same work, um, Ethiopia Awakening, uh, went to the Venice Biennale, which is a big art event over in Italy every two years, um, so she went there last year. So it's been great to also get the word out about her through these loans. It lets people know um, that of who she is. Hopefully people can get more interest of her. Mita's grandson David says within the past dozen or so years, more and more accolades have been granted in honor of his grandmother and his grandfather, Dr. Solomon Fuller. My grandfather, the first black psychiatrist, uh, Dr. Solomon Carter Fuller, as you know, these are two unbelievably great and talented for the nation that for the African-American uh, community uh, made unbelievable changes. Now that I'm older, and uh, able to really digest the magnitude of both of my grandparents. Every day I can smile at that and be proud. And it's also a source of communication with my own children and grandchildren about the need for them to realize that although the color of their skin uh, in some areas, even now, could be an obstacle, they should never make an excuse for being productive, positive, and accomplished because there's a role model or two that uh, went through so many barriers. They overcame those and achieved greatness. Tragically, almost all of the works Mita completed prior to moving to Framingham were lost in a warehouse fire in Philadelphia in 1910. Her exhibit at the Danforth Art Museum is on permanent display, and many of its pieces were created by Mita right here in Framingham. And in addition to her artwork, David shared with us that his grandmother was an inspiration to many women of his time who aspired to be more than just a caregiver to their families. He said women would visit her and she would read them poetry and counsel them, assuring them that they were valued and loved. David noted that Mita herself was loved and blessed by many. Brendan? And thank you for that, Mackenzie. The Danforth Art Museum also collaborated with Framingham State University's Center for Inclusive Excellence to curate and display five pieces of art created by black artists in celebration of Black History Month. You can find those pieces in FSU's O'Connor Hall. And in honor of Black History Month, for the first time in the city's history, Framingham's Memorial Building is displaying the colors green, red, and gold every night. In a statement, Mayor Charlie Sasitsky said in part, quote, This small gesture is a way to bring awareness that February is Black History Month. By acknowledging and celebrating black history, we can work towards a more inclusive and equitable society, end quote. The Framingham Public Library is also hosting poet Michael Brown at their main branch on Lexington Street to celebrate Black History Month. During his event entitled Sugar Honey Iced Tea, Brown will break down several verses from queer poets of color as well as their themes regarding race, gender, and sexuality. The event, which is next Tuesday, the 27th, will be from 7 to 8 p.m. It will also be streamed on the Framingham Public Library's YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Framingham Public Library. In case you didn't know, you can also look for us on social media to stay in touch during the week. We can be found at framenews underscore on both Instagram and X, where we provide daily updates. Also, subscribe to the Access Framingham YouTube channel and hit the bell icon to be notified when new episodes of The Frame go up each week. We're on Facebook as well. Find us there just by searching for The Frame. Shifting gears to the weekend weather outlook. Expect rain on Friday with light winds as well. Highs in the low 40s and lows in the upper 20s. It's slated to clear up on Saturday though. Sunshine with highs in the low 30s and lows in the mid-teens then. More sunny skies in the forecast for Sunday. Breezy with highs around 40 degrees and lows in the upper 20s. We're going to take a quick step aside, but when we return, Framingham's new full-time accountant is a familiar face. Plus, important tips for residents related to their energy bills. Stay tuned. We'll be back after this. My graduation was something I will never forget. People like you and me sometimes may have doubts in yourself, but I feel that everything's possible. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. I want to eat, eat, eat apples and bananas. I need to eat, eat, eat apples and bananas. 
apples and bananas. Why can't I eat, eat, eat apples and bananas? Support the Feeding America nationwide network of food banks to help provide meals to those in need. Join us at feedingamerica.org. And welcome back. Let's see what else is happening in our community as Framingham's new city accountant is a familiar face to those at the Memorial Building, which Harworth has officially returned to his old post. Harworth previously left the municipal government back in July, leaving Framingham without a full-time accountant for months, a period that featured then-CFO for Framingham, Louise Miller, resigning from her own position within the city. Harworth resumed his tenure with Framingham on Tuesday, as he has 26 years of prior experience already under his belt. Meanwhile, Framingham's Repair Cafe is back with a team of volunteers ready to help fix just about anything you may have that needs fixing. From clothing and jewelry to small appliances or computers and other electronics, a team will be standing by at Scott Hall near the Center Common to assist. Lamps, bikes, batteries, toys, and sewing machines, among other things, are also welcome. If you know what parts are needed to complete your repair, you're encouraged to prepare them and bring them with you. Additionally, a station for sharpening scissors, knives, and gardening tools will be provided. Everything the Repair Cafe has to offer is free of charge, though cash donations are welcome. The event will run from 2 to 5 p.m. this upcoming Saturday, the 24th. And finally tonight, the South Middlesex Opportunity Council is reminding residents that are struggling to pay home energy bills that the Massachusetts Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, or LIHEAP for short, might be able to help. No matter the heating source, oil, propane, electricity, whatever it may be, the program can assist eligible households by paying a portion of their winter heating bills. Eligibility can vary depending on factors like income or household size. LIHEAP's heating season goes until April 30th, so there is still time to apply. Residents are encouraged to complete an application either online or in person at a LIHEAP agency such as SMOC. You can visit smoc.org and search for LIHEAP or you can call SMOC directly at 508-620-1230 to learn more. Before we go tonight, we'd like to remind you that it's because of Access Framingham that we're able to bring you our coverage here at The Frame. Access Framingham is an independent nonprofit 501c3 that provides low to no cost training in creative opportunities in broadcast television, podcasting, animation, and video making. All residents, students, organizations, and businesses in the city can become members. Whether you're looking for opportunities to learn something new, host your own show, be around creative people, or get more involved in the, in the community, you can join Access Framingham today by visiting www.accessfram.tv. That will do it for this week's Framingham News in Focus. On behalf of everyone here at The Frame, thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Brendan Fitzpatrick. We'll talk to you next week. Take care.